This is the Content Marketing Podcast, episode number 133, What Mobile Audiences Want. Hello and welcome to the Content Marketing Podcast. This is the show where we help you attract and retain business through the power of quality content. I'm your host, Rachel Parker of Resonance Content Marketing, and today is July 30th, 2015. Well, hello there, or as we like to say in Texas, howdy. Thank you for joining us today for the Content Marketing Podcast. Just a reminder, we are live on iTunes and on Stitcher, so if you're listening to this episode on the blog, you can click on over and subscribe. And if you use a different app for your podcast listening pleasure, we also have an RSS feed, and I will provide that link in the blog post. For the month of July, which is nearly over, we are have been taking a closer look at some of the trends that are shaping the future of content marketing. Now, last week, we focused focused on the trend of the growing need to promote our content through tactics such as sponsored posts on social media. And I wanted to give a shout out to a listener who was generous enough to email me with some feedback about last week's episode. And he also happens to be a fellow podcaster. His name is Orlando Mergal from Puerto Rico. And his podcast is in Orlando, forgive me if I butcher this, Hablando de Tecnología. I hope I was somewhere in the neighborhood of being right. And that translates into speaking of technology. And Orlando has just built up a phenomenal audience and... I'm sure his podcast is wonderful if I only understood Spanish, but if you are into technology and you do understand Spanish, uh, please do check it out. His website is, um, and I'm going to have to say this again, hablando de uh, tecnología.com, and I will prov- also provide a link in the blog post for today's episode. Uh, okay, this week we are focusing on another trend that is shaping the future of our work as content marketers, and that is the rise of of the mobile audience. But first, it's time to check in with our news feed for this week's rundown of news you can use. Some interesting news out of Facebook this week. They have announced secret videos for publishers. So what Facebook is doing, it's allowing publishers or page owners to publish videos on Facebook that are only available via the URL. So it will not show up on their page. It will not show up in the timelines of their followers, but it will be um, available for anyone with whom they choose to share that URL. So let's just say, for example, you wanted to create a video that was just for your email subscribers that you didn't want anyone else to have access to, what you can now do is publish that on Facebook, send the URL in an email, and then your people on your list will have exclusive access to that content. And, you know, this is this is another jab at YouTube from the guys at Facebook. You know, they're looking to horn in on YouTube's dominance in the in the video arena. So if you are a um, if you put videos on YouTube, you will know about the unpublished option, which is, you know, you can publish the video, but it will not be searchable. It won't show up on your channel and will be available only to those who have the specific URL. Well, that's exactly what these secret videos are going to be like on Facebook. So I was thinking about, gosh, you know, why would you choose one over the other? Because you're not really worried about search because you don't want this video to be searchable anyway. And I I think the key is if your brand is super invested on Facebook and you really want to have everything all in one place, then, um, You know, it would definitely make sense to drive people to your Facebook page rather than to your YouTube channel. So if you are a big Facebook user and you do a lot of videos, and I hope you are, uh, look into those secret videos, brand new feature. Also some news out of Google that is stirring up a lot of conversation. Up to now, it was mandatory to have a Google Plus account to use any of the Google properties. So to use YouTube or to sign in to, um, you know, Google Calendar, Gmail, all that other stuff, you had to have a Google Plus account. And apparently people really hated it. Um, 
for me, it was no big deal because, you know, I'm on Google Plus anyway. But people really hated it, and they really let Google know how much they hated it. So Google is now getting rid of that requirement in response to that user feedback. But many people in the the social media slash content marketing world are reading a little bit more into this. Um, a lot of thought leaders saw that, that that old requirement, that Google Plus requirement, as kind of a desperate attempt to strong arm people into signing up for Google Plus, and that this latest development, kind of backtracking on that, is a first step of admitting defeat for Google Plus. And you know, it it may well be. Google Plus started back in the summer of 2011, so it's been around for four years, and it still has not caught on as a social network. Now, Google, you know, whenever people confront them on this, they, they say, oh, well, it's not a social network, and it was never intended to compete with Facebook, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, okay, what what is it? <laughs> you know, what what is your vision for it if it's not a social network? And so they've been kind of kind of hazy on, you know, what the purpose is and where it's going. Um, you know, is this the first nail in the coffin for Google Plus? Maybe, maybe not. But I will tell you, I will be on Google Plus until it breathes its last breath. Why? Because it's Google. Okay, Google Plus posts are still showing up in Google searches. You know, I'm still getting traffic from it. So, you know, I will be there until they turn the lights out and say the party's over. But um, just an interesting development over at Google this week. Okay, for our content hit of the week, I found a wonderful post over on the Marketing, Marketing Profs blog by Steve Hoffman. And it's called Case Studies Have Real Value, Seven Tips for Writing a Success Story That Succeeds. And I like this because, you know, success stories or case studies or customer stories, whatever we want to call them, you know, we tend to, or or marketers in the whole, tend to not give these a whole lot of of care and attention. We just kind of slap a story together, you know, lots of chest beating going on and just putting out there putting it out there, figuring, well, it'll speak for itself. But there really is both an art and a science to putting together a successful case study. And so Steve talks about seven steps for um, for creating a truly compelling case story, case study, excuse me, that people will actually want to read. Um, very, very interesting article, and I will post a link to it in the blog post for this episode. Okay, that's it for this week's update. If you stumble across something you think might be of interest to your fellow content marketers, please shoot it on over to us so that we can share. Now it's time for this week's spotlight segment, What Mobile Audiences Want. As I mentioned, this month has been all about the trends that are shaping the future of our work as content marketers, and today I want to talk about mobile audiences. Now, recently I was having coffee with a colleague, and we were talking about, indeed, some of the trends that are affecting our work, and, you know, when I brought up mobile, she kind of wrinkled up her nose and said, you know, I I don't get it. I mean, my clients are in front of a computer most of the day. Why should I even bother with mobile? And, you know, that it, there really has been a shift in the in the role of mobile in the importance of mobile over the last couple of years previously and by previously i mean just you know a couple of years ago you really only had to care about mobile if your audience was number one diehard road warriors you know guys who are always on planes trains and automobiles and never in front of a computer uh number two iphone addicted teenagers or three, people who did not have computers. You know, some people, instead of buying a computer, would buy, a, buy a smartphone and stay connected that way. Um, that has actually changed dramatically. And, and there are, you know, a lot of people speculate on, on why this why this trend is occurring, why mobile has grown so much. Uh, certainly the popularity of Wi-Fi, you know, there's Wi-Fi in more places. But I think there's also kind of a... Um, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy is not the word I want to use, but it's almost like a circular truism. I don't know if that's that's right, but you know, as as more and more companies have created mobile-friendly websites, I think more people are more likely to be on the mobile web. And the more people are on the mobile web, the more motivated brands are to update their websites. So, you know, because that mobile experience is getting better and better, more and more people are accessing the web through their mobile devices. And I'm going to lay some stats on you just to illustrate that point. 
A recent survey by Comscore revealed that mobile app usage grew 52 percent between 2013 and 2014, and it now accounts for more than half of U.S. digital media time digital media time spent. Uh, Cisco also did a survey, and they realized that average smartphone usage grew by 45 percent just in 2014. Um, eMarketers predicting that the number of global smartphone users will reach two billion by the year 2016. And um, and this is important for us. This last one is especially important for us content marketers. 65 percent of all emails are read first on mobile devices, and that was by a study by Movable Inc. So, you know, mobile is not just a a sorry alternative for people who do not have access to a computer, either temporarily or permanently. Um, you know, it it is here to stay. And I just my just my own consumption here in my house. My my husband my husband does not touch a computer from the time he comes home from work. You know, yeah, he has his laptop. It's sitting right there next to his space on the um, on the couch. But he is, when he is at home, he is on his tablet and he is on his phone. And, you know, for me, I also have my laptop near me constantly. And, um, but, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll just hop onto my phone. Either I want to share something on Instagram, which I can't do, or is a little more tedious to do on a, on a laptop. Or um, sometimes it's like, Gee, if I pick up my computer, I'm going to be tempted to work on stuff. But if I do something on my phone, then I'm, I'm protected from that. So, you know, whatever the reason. And, of course, you know, the Wi-Fi thing. People, it's not... Uh, it's no longer about being a being on a computer that has a wire plugging into the wall that connects you to the internet. Wi-Fi is everywhere. I can't remember the last time I, you know, we actually had a, a physically plugged in computer. So, um, it's so the world is changing, and mobile is here to stay. Of course, we had Google's Mobile Geddon a few months ago, where it upped the importance of mobile friendliness and determining those search results. So, um, you know, it's it's. It's here to stay, and it's growing and growing and growing. In fact, I'm predicting that as in as little time as a year or two, the term mobile strategy and mobile marketing is going to completely disappear. And we'll just be talking about the web. And, you know, whether you access the web via whatever type of device, yeah, we can get into device-specific discussions. But, you know, this whole mobile versus laptop versus God, does anybody use desktops anymore? I don't know. I haven't seen one in ages. But um, but all that's just going to kind of fall away, and it's all just going to be the web. So what does all this mean for us content marketers? Um, you know, I, I know on the content side, we tend to think of mobile friendliness as a design issue. You know, it's something we toss across the fence to the programmers. Yeah, make sure that the site looks good on mobile. Make sure it's got a you know, easy-to-access menu. Make sure everything renders correctly, et cetera, et cetera. But it actually affects our role as content marketers as well. We need to be making sure that every piece of content that we create and we publish meets the needs of those mobile users, people who are on smartphones and who are on tablets as well as people who are on um, actual computers. Um, that's probably a term that's going to change soon, huh? you think? You know, maybe we, we will just get rid of the distinction of computers versus devices. I don't know. Crazy world we live in, guys. Anyway, um, so how can we do this? How can we as content marketers adapt um, and better meet the needs of smartphone and tablet users? The first thing we can do is, you know, just be aware and to check our content regularly on those mobile devices. So, you know, periodically grab your smartphone, click over to your blog, make sure everything looks okay um, when you pull up a post, and just have the experience of reading a post from beginning to end. And notice, you know, step back and be objective and say, you know, is there anything annoying about this experience? Is there anything that make, would make me want to want to click away from this or Mobile, experience, mobile equivalent tap away from this content and and go on to something else. You know how do your how do your images look? How is your content being presented? How um, you know how long are your paragraphs? Are you um, are you scrolling 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 and still in the same paragraph? Just check your content on a regular basis and email too. Actually, you want to make sure and check those emails and make sure that that email content is. Um, 
It makes for a good experience on mobile devices as well, because remember, 65% of those puppies are opened on mobile devices first. The second thing we can do is to keep it right and tight. Now, I'm not saying that we can no longer have longer content, that those 2,000 word blog posts are a thing of the past and will never return. Um, but we need to be aware of just how little people can see when they're on those mobile devices. So I did a little test on my iPhone. I clicked on over to my, or tapped on over to my blog, and I discovered that I, at any given time, I could see about 24 lines on the screen, and there was an average of about six words per line. So your mobile user is going to be looking at about 150 words per screen. That is not a whole lot. Okay, if you think about a 500 word blog post, that's a little more than three swipes to get from beginning to end. And this might be a post that if you bring up on a laptop screen or a, or a full-time mo full-size monitor, you could see the whole thing. So we need to be aware that, you know, those mobile users are having to swipe to get to the end of that content. And what we need to do is make sure that every swipe pays off. So Keep your topic tight. Make sure you are selecting um, good specific topics. Stick with that topic from beginning to end. And make sure that you are engaging your audience all the way through. Remember to make your paragraphs shorter. Make sure to use bullet lists. All those best practices for online content kind of go double when we're talking about mobile audiences because not only is that screen much smaller, but I think we're also dealing with a much larger distraction level. You know, if you're sitting at a desk facing a really big monitor, then there's kind of a limit to what can distract you. But if you're focused on a on a five inch, six inch screen, just think about all the other things that are in, in your peripheral vision going on around you that can distract you from that. So we need to really be aware of the need to Number one, make that a good experience, and number two, to um, to make it easy for that mobile user to and make it pleasant. God forbid, yes, make it pleasant and engaging for them to um, encounter your content. And then the, another thing that we can do is to remember the "you are here" factor. Now, if you've ever been at a mall or a convention center or another big area and gotten lost, looked at a map, what's the first thing you do? You find the "you are here." the red arrow, the red dot, whatever it is. And when when we talk about mobile users, again, they're only seeing about 150 words or, or you know, I don't know, possibly. Well, yeah, if you're on an Apple Watch, you'd see a lot less. Um, but we need to remind audiences of where they are to make sure that we are putting up signposts throughout that process. So we need to make sure to include subheads at least every two or three paragraphs. Um I guess you wouldn't put one in the middle of a paragraph, would you? No, um, every every definitely every three paragraphs, probably every two. And then think about thinking about your website content for those longer pages, such as your FAQ page, more reference style pages. We want to make sure that we are using internal links to help the users kind of hop around that page without having to scroll, scroll, scroll all the way to the top and scroll, scroll, scroll all the way back to the bottom. So those are just three things that we as content marketers can do to ensure that we're meeting the needs of that all-important mobile audience. If you have any questions or want to add to the conversation, or if you have some advice for better engaging mobile users, I would love to hear from you, just like I did from Orlando last week. And I will give you that contact info at the end of the podcast. Now it's time for our content marketing tip of the week. For today's tip, I want to continue our discussion about mobile, but I want to flip it around and let you know that mobile devices are useful not only for engaging with content, for reading those blog blog posts, listening to those podcasts, etc., but they can also be very helpful in creating that content. There is a host of apps out there just for content creators, and there are apps to um, help us get our blog posts published, to create and publish videos. Um, we've got apps to create visuals like infographics to create memes um, which is one of my one of my pet projects that I love doing uh, for presentations there's haiku deck for podcasting um, 
apparently there's an app called Boss Jack, Boss Jock, excuse me, which is um, which is a phenomenal app for podcasting. So as you start to think more along the mobile lines, remember that the mobile web is, or that mobile devices, excuse me, are not only a content consumer's best friend, but it's also a great place to meet your needs and to better do your job and to do your job with more um, with more flexibility and more convenience as a content creator. Okay, campers, that is it for me today. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Content Marketing Podcast. If you like what you've heard, please feel free to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or via our RSS feed. And if you really like what you've heard, please leave us a quick review on iTunes. I would so appreciate it. For more information about content marketing, you are welcome to visit our website at resonancecontent.com, where you'll also find links to our pages on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and other social networks. I also invite you to check out our monthly webinar series. Now, we did something different in July because of schedules getting a little wonky and vacations going on, etc., etc. So this month's webinar is on demand. So we just put it out there at the beginning of the month, and it's just been available for anyone who would like like to get access to it. Uh, It is our Blogging 101 webinar, which is one of our most popular webinars. And to get access, just go to resonancewebinar.com, sign up, and you'll get instant access to that on-demand webinar. As always, I like to leave you with a quote, and today's comes from E.L. Doctorow. He once said, quote, Good writing is supposed to evoke sensation in the reader, not the fact that it is raining, but the feeling of being rained upon, unquote. Again, this is Rachel Parker with Resonance Content Marketing. Thank you again for listening, and we will see you again next week. Take care. <laughs>